All right, if everybody could please take your seats um, for the event. Um, I'm going to introduce first Lisa Will, who is the resident astronomer at the Fleet Science Center and a professor of astronomy at uh, San Diego City College. Good evening, everyone. Glad to have you here for, um, let's see, we are cosmologists. Ask me anything. And I hold you to that, right? So I am your moderator for this panel. And it looks like the uh, the way that you've set up is we're going to do a we're panel with some questions. And then you can break up and then just ask, astronom uh, ask the cosmologist anything you want. Sound good? All right. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started with introductions. You've already heard who I am, so let's go to the cosmologist. How do you want to sit next to me? Oh, you're just too happy. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Karen Perez Sarmiento, and I'm uh, and I'm entering my third year at, univers at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I work for the Simons Observatory. Uh, my lab is in charge of um, building, putting together, and testing one of the telescopes for the Simons, one of the receivers for the Simons Observatory, the Large Aperture Telescope. And yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Very great. My name is Katie Harrington. I'm a postdoc at the University of Chicago right now. And my lab in UChicago, we've been working on the integration and testing for the optics tubes for the receiver that Karen's lab works on. So we've taken this optics tube, put in some detectors and readout and stuff, and we've been working on making sure that they're going to work optically in the way that we need to make sure the telescope can get the science that we want to get. Thank you. I'm Brian Keating, professor of physics at UC San Diego. I usually lecture to people that are far more drunk than you guys, so you'll have to... <laughs> Please indulge yourself tonight. <laughs> and uh, I am also the director of the project office of the University of San Diego, Rock, California, San Diego, runs the Simons Observatory. So we're the money men and women on campus. And we make sure that we never run out of money. That's what all telescopes travel are. <laughs> uh, so excited to speak to everybody today. And I'm also the host of the Dr. Brian Keating YouTube channel and Into the Impossible podcast, and author of a couple of books that we might talk about. Hi everyone, so my name is Zach Huber. I am a third year going on fourth year PhD student at the university, at Cornell University, working in a group that works for a couple different telescope projects like the CCAT Prime Project and the ACT Telescope, but we also do a lot of work for Simons Observatory with detector and readout hardware and software, and that's what I've been involved in at Cornell. Mike, so you're going to have to bear with us a little. So I thought what I'd do, first of all, is ask uh, Dr. Keating if you would give us the uh, Simons Observatory in a nutshell talk. So the Simons Observatory was conceived in 2016 to look for the, uh, the infant universe's baby picture, basically. Looking for how the universe came to be, how it's evolved since, what it's made of, how old it is. Well, whether it will ever die, the universe will ever come to an end. And to do that, we uh, constructed four massive telescopes, one that's six meters, 20 feet in diameter, and that is uh, that is called the Creatively Large Aperture Telescope. And then we have three small aperture telescopes, which are only a half a meter in diameter, but they're big enough to do the job that we're looking for them to do, which is to look for the signals of gravitational waves from the early universe. Whereas the big telescope is looking for the small scale features on the microwave sky, including the imprint of ghostly particles called neutrinos, dark matter, and other phenomena that was, it is uniquely suited to do. And to do this, we cool our detectors down to just a whisker above absolute zero. So balmier than a San Diego evening, at minus 454 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, uh, or about 0.1 degree Kelvin or Celsius above zero. And to do that, we uh, make use of an exquisite technology that the students and postdocs are working on. And we are also in, uh, enjoined by our fellow cosmologists who work on theory and data analysis, and there's many of them here tonight as well. So this is a massive, the biggest project of its kind ever conceived to look for these signals, which are really the imprint of on the world, on the universe's oldest light, called the cosmic microwave background. So it takes a village of over 300 cosmologists 
on all seven continents, uh, which is pretty amazing. And we're gathered here this week at the University of California, San Diego, to have our first face-to-face -face meeting in person uh, in three years since the global pandemic. That shall not be named like Voldemort. Uh, we will not mention its name. Uh, but nevertheless, we are uh, very excited to host our fellow friends and cosmologists, some of whom I haven't seen uh, since I put on about 10 pounds during COVID. Uh, but anyway, we're excited to welcome you to the public. I always say in my channel and elsewhere that it's the duty of a scientist to explain to the public in terms he or she can understand what we do, because you guys pay our salaries, uh, if not directly through the University of California, I'm a state employee, but through your taxes, and you support the dreams and, and, and love affair that we all have with astronomy and cosmology. So that's kind of a nutshell of what we are doing in Science Research. So I thought what I'd do now is I would ask each of our panelists um, what they are currently, like you heard already a little bit of what you're working on, what you're working on, and how this uh, impacts the overall mission of the Science Observatory. Yeah, so uh, the tel the, my lab uh, is building and testing the Large Aperture Telescope Receiver, which is one of the cameras for one of the, well, it's a camera for the large telescope uh, that's part of Simon's Observatory, and we are in charge of. Uh, well, first, my lab, some of my lab mates design most of the uh, uh, the receiver, the camera itself. Um, we've been working on uh, putting it together and also making sure that it works, or that it will work as expected. So, uh, as Brian mentioned earlier, uh, we have to cool down our receivers to very low temperatures. So we and and this thing is massive. Like the, the the camera that we're talking about is not just like a regular camera. It's a 2.5 meter dia uh, meter diameter ca uh, cylinder, pretty much. So it is it is pretty hard to cool some to cool down something that big uh, to such small temperatures. And we also now have to make sure that um, obviously materials when they cool down they shrink so we have to make sure that everything remains in like, and after all after all this is a camera so it has to remain in focus so we have to make sure that every all the pieces stay in the correct positions such that once everything is cooled down things are in focus we also have to um, make sure that we're able to read temperatures inside this uh, receiver uh, right now we're working on setting up our detectors and Katie was working with us <laughs> last week to do that. It was an intense week. Um, yeah, so that's what my lab does. Um, and a little, uh, besides that, I also work a little bit on um, observing um, galaxy clusters using um, the data that we obtained from a similar telescope that is already built uh, and a similar uh, re uh, receiver that's already built. So we observe these galaxy clusters, which are just like um, groups of many, many galaxies. They're, like they're the largest structure that you can see, that the largest uh, gravitationally bound structure in the universe. Um, so yeah, and the Simons Observatory will, have, uh, the LATR will eventually uh, allow us to discover many more of these objects in the universe and, and learn a lot about the universe from, from them. So yeah. Thanks, Karen. So, like I said, I'm Katie Harrington, and at UChicago, we kind of actually exist in the realm between the small aperture telescopes and the large aperture telescope. So, as Brian said, the large aperture telescope is a six meter telescope, so that's massive mirrors. And Karen was explaining the receiver, which is literally larger than like a Ford 250 truck. It's massive. Um, but the thing with that tr that you know truck sized receiver cooling that down to one degree uh, point one degrees above absolute zero takes a really long time when you have thirty thousand detectors in it, um, and so we knew that we weren't going to be able to fully test it in situ with with like in North America we weren't going to be able to cool it down enough times and do all of the testing we needed in the LATR because it would have just taken too long we would have been testing for ten years and we never would have gotten the field. So one of the things we decided to do was to build a test cryostat um, where we could take one of their optics tubes. They're going to have up to 13 optics tubes, and we're going to take one of them and make sure that it was working as it should by itself before we installed it into the large telescope. So what we did, and so we did was we took one of the small aperture telescopes, which those are only a, only quote unquote a half meter in diameter. That thing is still about the size of like a Volkswagen Beetle. It's a, still a big cryostat. 
but um, we took one of those and we adapted it to hold one of those optics tubes for the LATR and set up our whole lab so that we could do optics testing. So um, one of the things to think about is like telescopes, they work in the microwaves just like they do in the optical. We have uh, lenses and we have filters that make sure that the light focuses down from um, from like the, well actually, I guess I should start. First we have mirrors, right? Like in big, big optical telescopes, we have mirrors that focus the light into a camera. And that camera then is also similar in that it has lenses and filters and things that make sure that you get the light you want from just where the telescope is pointing and that it's all the right colors that you want. So things like, uh, we call them frequencies, but they're the same colors. If you, want to, if you think you're observing blue light, but you're actually observing orange light, you're going to get the wrong science. And so we have to care a lot about making sure that that sort of stuff is as we've designed. So uh, our lab built um, several different large like optical test structures so that we could test things like whether, making sure that when you pointed the telescope this way, you didn't get light coming over from a corner or that you know, when you were trying to observe blue light, we didn't get, get orange light. And so the last couple of years, we've been um, putting together this first ca camera set, set up. And um, I think, we, when did we officially, we finish, officially finished in May testing the very first optics tube. Then we have shipped it to Pennsylvania and where they have put it now into the large aperture telescope and they just got cold and we're trying to get it working there where it's bigger and more complicated with even more detectors. I think I think that, that focal plane that you guys have has now 12,000 detectors in it which is the largest that's been done so far. Uh, it's only going to get bigger in the next couple of years so it's pretty exciting. Of course we got to get it to Chile first so it actually looks at the sky instead of the lab. Uh, but that's going to be fun. Uh, so the next couple years we're going to keep doing that. Um, some of the other stuff I do is a lot of uh, data analysis and data processing, working on making sure that as the time streams come off the telescope, because we don't get we don't get nice pictures as a starting point. We get just streams of numbers that we have to then process and put together with where the telescope was pointing and what the properties of how the detectors were turned on and stuff. And to, to we, it's a lot of just like you know indexing and checking and stuff to take these like time streams that we read out from our detectors and make them into the maps that we expect and we need um, to do science with. So I've been doing a lot of uh, analysis on that as well uh, at the same time. So, is this thing still feeding? Can you guys, it's ironic, this place is called Amplified Ale. <laughs> <laughs> you think the amplification would be more sufficient. So I don't get to work as much. I'm jealous of these guys who work in the lab all day long and get to do fun stuff, at least for us nerds. It's considered very fun, fun to be in the lab. I'm more uh, focused on, no pun intended, the bigger picture of where the, co where the direction of the observatory is headed. Do we have enough assets, resources, people? which is really the lifeblood of the observatory. So I spend most of my time on telecons, not telescopes, unfortunately. But, uh, but it's still fun to, to have a little bit of a foot or finger in each one of these different uh, projects, sub-projects that Katie and Karen and Zach will talk about. And getting really focused on the big picture and keeping the motivation for the observatory together. And just, you know, just yesterday I was out on a walk with one of my kids and uh, he was asking me, you know, well, what if uh, the universe is older than, uh, than we think it is? Or what if the universe had a bounce? It didn't have a big bang. And I'm thinking like, where are you getting this from? And he said from, uh, he said from Neil deGrasse Tyson. So I, I felt <laughs> proud uh, but, but in actuality, we don't know if the universe had a big bang. We don't know if there was just one big bang. We don't know if there's just one universe. It could be a multiverse. And we get to think, I get to think about those topics and how we might address these big picture questions, which again, no pun intended. That's the reason most of us got into this scientifically, and the means to the end, to get to that end, to understand how the universe began, if it had a beginning at all, we don't know, uh, really requires the brilliance of the people that are up here. So I, I get great satisfaction from my students, the postdocs, although at UC San Diego we are responsible for one of the main first cameras, the small aperture telescope that Katie talked about, and the platforms in which these things sit on. And, uh, and, and in reality, thinking about this as something, a gift to you know, generations to come that will use the technologies and so forth that we're building just today uh, gives me a great source of pride and uh, admiration for my colleagues. So, with that, we'll give it back. Yeah, so before a, these detectors can ever make their way to an actual optical system, like the ones that Katie and Karen are talking about, they have to actually be tested. They have to be fabricated, so they have to be produced, 
and then they have to be tested to make sure that they're working as we expect them to work and that we understand their properties really well before we can go and add all the complexity that they're talking about with the optical systems and the actual camera. And so at Cornell, we do a lot of testing of the detectors themselves. So we get these little detector wafers, so just a couple centimeters wide and yeah, that size. Um, and we get them from our collaborators at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And our collaborators at Princeton take them and put them together into a little package that contains the detectors and contains all the electronics that you need to communicate with the detectors to understand what's happening when things are changing with them. And then we take those and we put them in one of our dilution refrigerators at Cornell and we cool them down to just 0 0.1 degrees above absolute zero like we've been talking about. And there we run a bunch of different tests to make sure that we understand all the different properties of the detectors. Our detectors are really cool. They're, they're something called transition edge sensors. And so they operate with superconductors. So superconductors are materials that when they're cold enough, they have no resistance whatsoever. But at some point, they transition from having no resistance to having a finite resistance. And we operate them right at that boundary between no resistance and a finite resistance, which makes them super sensitive thermometers. Any change that happens to the detector in terms of the amount of light that hits it changes the resistance because it's really close to this boundary where it switches from zero resistance to some finite resistance. And so there's a lot of complexity to how we actually operate these detectors and making sure that they're all working and that there are no problems with the electronics that we use to communicate with them. And that's the main thing that we do for Simons Observatory at Cornell. Um, personally, I'm also involved in some data analysis with work um, from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, which is a predecessor telescope to Simons Observatory. And so it's kind of the successor telescope that will be able to go a little bit further than the ACT telescope currently has. My project is looking at trying to study different types of dark matter particles that could be causing effects uh, in the polarization of the light from the cosmic microwave background. So that's one of the things that I also work on, in addition to the detectors and readouts work that I do. So it's really fascinating listening to you talk because you're at the point where you're building the instrumentation, you're testing the instrumentation, but like Dr. Keating said, there's a big picture to this. And I'm curious about what each of you look forward most to what this telescope can give, either as it impacts your own research or if it's the sort of thing that you think you can come do an astronomy on tap and get the public excited about. All right, so I guess this is Coming again from the experience that I have doing some analysis projects so far, I guess I'm interested in galaxy clusters in um, understanding how this very large structure, the largest structure in the universe, uh, formed, and understanding how we can get uh, information about the universe itself from studying these uh, conglomerations of clusters of, of uh, galaxies. So uh, one of the things that we can measure is, for instance, um, the matter density of the universe, how much matter there is in the universe, uh, both like baryonic, like both normal matter and dark matter, which you might have heard about. Um, we can get information about um, even things like uh, the the masses of these very tiny particles that uh, particle physicists are very interested in, like uh, the, the neutrinos. Uh, these are very like, elusive particles, they don't interact with almost anything. Um, and yet we can learn about these tiny particles that pre like are pretty hard to work with uh, in uh, accelerators and we can understand their uh, we can learn something about their masses um, through like, through also under uh, learning about the largest structure in the universe so I think that's that's something that's very exciting to me like that uh, intersection of uh, large-scale structure and also the uh, particle physics um, yeah. So one of the things that I like the most about being an instrumentalist and working on the hardware is that I get to claim all of the science and say that I'm so excited about all of the science because the work that I do directly contributes to it. So I'll tell you some of the ones that I'm like very interested in in this sort of stuff. So one of the things about the CMB, which is this cosmic microwave background, this is this entire thing that uh, we build these telescopes primarily to observe, is that it really is the universe's baby picture. We take this light that is currently in the microwave, so it's currently at about 2.7 Kelvin, uh, so it's 2.7 degrees above absolute zero, but it's throughout the entire universe. And we rewind it back in time, 
where the universe expands as, as we go forward in time, the universe expands. So as we go backwards in time, the universe shrinks, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and that means it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And so you go farther and farther back, eventually it's too hot for normal particles like atoms, hydrogen, helium, all these normal particles. It gets too hot for that. And you keep going further, it gets more and hotter and hotter and hotter. And it finally gets to a point where lots of the physics that we have currently just break down. Um, and we're trying to figure out what can exist in realm, in, during that time period, during those realms. So um, this is hotter than any sort of energy scale that we can do and have on Earth. Like, you, you may have heard of the LHC and other particle colliders where people like spin particles around, uh, you know, massive rings or, like, uh, and crash them together trying to make really high energy uh, collisions. We're going hotter and deeper, further back in time, closer to like, you know, the fundamental, fundamental physics. And um, this hot plasma that exists on there, it has interactions that we call baryonic acoustic oscillations, but these are just like oscillations of uh, pressure waves inside of this primordial plasma. And how these pressure waves evolve in time tell us a lot about what sort of particles exist during, while the uh, plasma is evolving. So uh, we can do things with, uh, by, by measuring the patterns that we see across the sky, we can do things like figure out what particles existed during different times, and if the patterns change in slightly diff in slight ways, we can actually find out if there are new particles. And so we're looking for new particles with, through this uh, search for this thing we call, um, we often call it search for ineffective, or the effective number of relativistic particles in the early universe. And through making a very detailed high-resolution map, we'll actually be able to see if um, anything existed that's not currently part of the standard model. Uh, and then similarly, this really high-resolution map looks at how uh, gravitational lensing has occurred throughout the entire universe. So as the CMB light then Where's travels Ryan? forward towards us through the universe, galaxy clusters, as uh, Karen was talking about, and then just like general like large masses, cause this light to deflect and move around. And we're going to make a big map of that. And that map will then tell us um, when and how uh, structure was forming in the universe, which then informs things like dark matter and neutrinos and how they've affected uh, you know, matter across, across time. And it helps us figure out what's inside the universe. And I just think that's like fundamentally very cool. So one of the biggest myths about scientists is that we start off with this checklist called the scientific method and we start off with a hypothesis and then we go to our methods and our tools and our techniques and our experiments. We don't really do that. What is most interesting for scientists is when they find something that doesn't really fit, that doesn't make sense with what we already know. And there's examples of that throughout history, from the theory of evolution to the theory of Einstein's relativity and other things that didn't make sense until some experiment came along and totally upended everything that scientists thought for generations. So there's no such thing as the end of science. We're not going to come to the end, even if we come to the very beginning of time when we look at our data. So it's dangerous when a scientist thinks about what he or she wants to find or wants to see. Instead, he should be thinking about what evidence we can use to glean new information that surprises us. The most important thing that a scientist can say, according to Isaac Asimov, who's a great author and scientist, and uh, one of the reasons my oldest son is named Isaac. He said the most uh, important phrase a scientist can say is that's bleeping weird. <laughs> there are kids here, so I have to be careful. Uh, they didn't card very effectively. Uh, but um, <laughs> yeah, even the things that don't fit in, that don't make sense with our currently understood paradigm of the universe. And those surprises will point us in new directions that we couldn't have predicted ahead of time. And to that end, I'm also, uh, but what I am interested in, I know there's certain things we're going to do. It's not like we're going to build this thing, turn it on, and what? Oh, it works? Great. That's wonderful. You owe me 50 bucks, Katie. Uh, but no, we, we know it's going to do certain things. And one of the most exciting things it's going to do is dovetail with our sister and neighbor experiments in Chile, like, uh, like the Vera Rubin Observatory, the James Webb Space Telescope, which we'll talk about. We'll be able to inform them, as Katie said, the baby picture is the oldest picture at least after your parents had this particular type of Big Bang, I'm not going to get into that, uh, but the oldest light in the universe can then provide the initial state from which everything else comes and can be compared to. 
So we'll probably talk about a little bit about JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, successor to Hubble. The first light images coming out on Tuesday. Uh, stay tuned for that. It's going to be really exciting. Thank you. We had nothing to do with that here, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but we can, uh, we can combine our data with their data and get together, do things they can't do, and they can do things that we can't do. And in doing so, we develop the most complete picture of what science is really telling us. Great. So there are many wonderful things that we are doing in terms of the science that we do and it would be cool to talk about. I think one of the things I'm most excited for is simply seeing the telescope actually come together and start operating. I mean, there is a ton, a ton of work that is being done by all these people sitting back here who you've got a chance to talk to later in the evening to make this telescope a reality. And it's a huge engineering challenge. It's a huge scientific challenge where there are many different problems that we have to resolve on the way, many different things we have to discover about our detectors and about our optics about how you cool down such a large thing to such a cold temperature. All of these things are really hard to do, and so the, actually seeing the telescope working, I think, will be one of the coolest things um, in terms of future things that we can look forward to. Uh, but then of the science that we can do, one thing that hasn't been mentioned except briefly by Brian earlier is there is this very particular pattern in the polarization of the light from the very early universe that could be out there, we don't know for sure. Um, so there's this pattern that's called uh, B mode, inf so like B mode, inf B mode polarization signal uh, that could be a relic of early gravitational waves in the early universe. And this could be a signal that helps us to know about what the Big Bang was actually like. It could help us to know about whether the theory of inflation, which is our current best model for how uh, the universe expands immediately after the Big Bang, it could help us to know if that's actually correct or if that's something that uh, needs to be kind of relegated to the dustbin of history. And we need to find a new method or a new model for uh, what actually happened in the very early universe. And this is something that Simon's, Simon's Observatory, particularly our small aperture telescopes, is going to be very directly looking for, this, this very unique polarization signal. And that's something that, whether we find it or not, will actually be incredibly interesting either way. If we find it, it will be a really, a really big advance in our field in terms of understanding what happened in the early universe. If we don't find it, then there's something new out there, and that's just as exciting. While the audience is thinking of some questions that they might want to ask, I did want to do a lightning round about JWST because for the last couple of months at every public outreach event I've done, I've been like, what are you looking forward to? That's the question I've been getting. What have you been looking forward to that JWST is going to do? Several images will be coming out in the first release, which excited me. I thought we were just going to get like one, and now I'm just like, several images of different objects, but, ah, including the thing that I wanted to see the most. So I'm hoping that all of you will say, like, with this telescope, uh, JWST, large infrared telescope, sitting out there, one of the Lagrange points, it can see stuff that we can't see from the ground. What are you the most excited for that uh, JWST can see that we haven't seen before, at least at that level of uh, resolution? Yeah, it, it is very cool because, as Lisa mentioned, it is a near-infrared, mid-infrared telescope, and um, as light, as light travels to the universe uh, and the universe expands, the light also um, redshifts. It kind of the the wavelength of the light gets longer and longer and longer, which means that um, the effect of that is that light looks redder, right? So, so very old galaxies will look redder, and JWST will allow us to observe uh, some of the very first stars and first galaxies uh, in the universe out there. So the, when the universe um, it is, uh, I guess, a period called reionization when the universe became ionized again. Um, so with the CMB, we usually we, we, we usually study the period when the universe became uh, neutral, when, um, as Katie mentioned, all the um, pr uh, all the par like particles combined into neutral hydrogen, and and then after that there was a period that we call dark ages, um, like kind of you know not everything. Uh, Light could just travel freely, but um, there was no structure yet. There were no stars really to create uh, nuclear reactions and emit light um, until this point called reionization, when the first stars and the first galaxies begin to form. And because this happened um, a very long time ago, light from these all these objects will be pretty red, and hopefully JWST will allow us to to observe those things. 
So I have a really nerdy answer for this because it's uh, the stuff that two of my best friends worked on while they were in grad school, and so I'm really hoping to see things what they did. Um, and this is this thing called a, a non-redundant mask that is on, I think it's the nearest in nearest instrument. So one of the cameras in, on JWST has this very specific device that it can put inside its filter wheel. And uh, when you stick that device in front of uh, the camera and you try to take a photo of a star, you can do things called, um, you can do what's called optical interferometry. And the idea of that is to be able to look closer and closer around the edges of the stars without having to do like some active like coronagraph type thing or active canceling or anything. The idea is to just be able to take a single photo with this very specifically designed mask and to see around the edges. And of course, when you're looking around the edges of stars, you're looking for exoplanets. And so that's this whole new way of trying to image for exoplanets that flew on JWST. Um, and they've tried it a little bit from the ground, but it's much harder from the ground because the atmosphere gets in the way, especially for optical and infrared wavelengths. So the wavelengths that Hubble and now JWST work at, the, the atmosphere causes light to bounce around. That's why stars twinkle. And that, but that bouncing around is really annoying for science when you're trying to see tiny, tiny planets around the edge. So on Earth, we build these massive systems to try to cancel out all of the atmospheric wiggles. But you go to space and you don't need those systems, so then you get to start trying to do even more entertaining pieces. So I'm not going to get those photos and find out how that works on Tuesday, because that's going to be a science thing that's probably going to be years to come out. So I'm also very, very excited about just seeing these big full-scale colors and stuff but um, that one actually is the thing that I'm most excited about for JWST because it's what my best friends are going to get to look at and they've been working on it for years so to me the most second most interesting question in all of science is is there life on other planets uh, or are we alone I happen to think we are alone in the universe I know that's an opinion not shared by probably most of my cosmology colleagues here, but there's zero evidence for life elsewhere in the universe, and we have to be guided by evidence. Anyway, the uh, thing that's going to be released on Tuesday is an image, uh, not of the light of a planet, an exoplanet, but the spectrum of an exoplanet. And this uh, planet has a very whimsical name that I almost chose for one of my kids called Wasp 9796b, uh, which means it's around the star called Wasp 96, and it's the first planet. It's uh, about half the mass of Jupiter, and it orbits in just three days around its star, and the star is not unlike the sun. So it's a very unlikely place to find life, and yet it will be a good calibration source for looking at the power of JWST to detect the possible signatures of life on alien planets. And I think that discovery would be quite monumental for uh, for humanity to make. And don't expect it's going to happen on Tuesday, but it's going to pave the way forward for, as I say, the, the, the second most interesting question that a scientist could possibly answer after, was there a Big Bang or were there multiple Big Bangs? So one of the coolest things that the Hubble Space Telescope did is that they chose to just stare at a very dark patch of the sky for a very long time. This is called the Hubble Deep Field. And it's, if you haven't seen it before, I, I recommend that you go and look up the pictures of the Hubble Deep Field, because it's one of the most beautiful pictures, I think, in all of science. Basically, you look at a patch of sky that from here on Earth looks just like blackness. It looks like there's nothing there. But when you stare at it with a very, very sensitive space telescope for a very long time, you see that there are actually thousands and thousands of galaxies, billions and billions of stars, in that one dark patch. The James Webb Space Telescope on Tuesday, I believe, will exceed that picture in terms of how deep it will look at one dark region on the sky, and this is just the beginning. So we will get with the James Webb Space Telescope, I mean, a really unprecedented look at just how many galaxies and stars there are in the universe, and at all the potentially undiscovered things that lurk in the dark corners of the universe, and I think that is one of the coolest things that James Webb will do. Members, it's any questions you have for the panelists? <laughs> yeah, hi. I have a, I have a quick question about the large aperture, uh, large aperture telescope. 
Um, so there are a number of detectors in it, and there's going to be a lot of computers running for them. There's going to be a lot of electrical wiring that's causing electrical resistance and heat. And this is a challenge to manage that, that heat generated by the resistance in the uh, telescope uh, to about 0.1 kilowatts. Is that something you have to balance as well? Let me just make sure, did the audience hear the question? Okay, so there was a question about uh, with, okay. but there was a question about with all of the detectors and all of the electronics, do you have to worry about the heat from the electronics itself actually affecting the ability of your detectors? Yes, that's one of the big things that my lab is most concerned with, right? Um, making sure that we can get all the data out from the if you think about it like this, um, our receiver, our camera is built like an onion in many different stages. So like, you go from the colder stage where the detectors are sitting, and then you have to like have kind of like uh, stages where it gets a bit warmer and a bit warmer and a bit warmer until you get to like 300 uh, Kelvin, like room temperature, right? Like the temperature that we're at right now. So indeed, it's very hard to. Um, to do that, and we have uh, lots of uh, cables and wiring from like with special materials that both work at very like that allow us to uh, transport data from the detectors from the coldest stage, and then around all the different stages. And we have to make sure also that um, the environmental uh, noise around of where we're going to be, we're going to be eventually in Chile, but right now we're testing at Penn. We have to make sure that um, our detectors and our readout is not affected by things like the magnetic field of the Earth, or, you know, Wi-Fi, <laughs> things like, uh, or any, or any other radio frequency interference. Uh, we have to also make sure, for instance, that um, our, um, the vibration environment, the, the, the telescope, the movement of the telescope, or any other uh, slight movements don't make our detectors and our readout completely, like, send out, um, um, Bridge affect the signal that we're trying to measure. So yeah, it is it is a huge challenge, and it is one of the things that we've been uh, working on at the telescope uh, at at, the, uh, at Penn. Um, of course, it com it is everything from the design of how you um, how we make sure that even the cables stay uh, clamped. Like that 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 seems like not a big deal, but it's it's a huge issue. Like you you cannot imagine all the discussions that go behind. <laughs> Doors. Like it's it's really hard to make sure that um, our cables stay in place. They uh, their uh, their heat so that they're uh, they're coupled correctly to the temperature in, the, in that stage. That they can transport the data. That they don't um, inter uh, that the, the environmental noise doesn't interfere with them. So yeah, it's it's indeed a huge challenge. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a really great question, and Karen just indicated, I mean, there's a huge amount of work that goes into on the cryogenic side trying to take care of excess heat. On the detector and readout side, we also do something called multiplexing, which is really key to this problem that you're talking about. So if we had to have an input and an output wire for every detector that we're going to operate, which will eventually be over 100,000 detectors across these telescopes, A, it would just be almost impossible, it would, just, it would be impossible to run that many wires into and out of the cryoset. And also any residual heating from these, most of them are superconducting wires, so they have very little electrical resistance, but even the ones that do have some resistance, they would cause an enormous heat load. It would be impossible to operate our detectors correctly. So what we do is we, we do something called frequency division multiplexing, which is a fancy term for basically saying that we couple each detector to a resonator that has a different frequency. And then we put a thousand resonators on one set of cables and we send in sine waves of different frequencies that are tuned to each one of these detectors so that each sine wave just interacts with a single detector, but they're all on the same cable. And so we use the principle of superposition, the fact that you can add many, many sine waves of different frequencies together to get some complex uh, frequency column, we call it, to interact with up to a thousand detectors on one pair of wires. And that's on the detector readout side, that's how we actually get around uh, some of these, these we, we still cause lots of thermal heat problems for the team, of Penn. but uh, we, this is how we get around a lot of the issues that you're bringing up, is that we, we work on ways to include more and more detectors on smaller and smaller numbers of wires. Yeah, just one comment on that. We measure the power at 100 millikelvin in microwatts and nanowatts, so 10 to the negative 9 and 10 to the negative 6. It's tiny, tiny bits of power still affect us. <laughs> 
How do you keep the telescope clean? <laughs> okay, now that is a fantastic question, actually. That is, you don't even know. That's a complicated one. Oh, who wants to take this? Star wash. <laughs> we try our best. And... <laughs> no, that's actually a very, very good question because uh, we actually have to take these telescopes up to Chile. And so we take them up to the very top of a mountain where um, the best analogy I have for what it looks like up there is Mars. It's red and dusty and windy. Um, how do we keep it clean? By just building in a lot of different, let's say, called administrative and environmental controls to make sure that we don't open up things that can't get, be... We have things that we, if we opened them and they got dirty, we wouldn't be able to use them again. So the rules are you don't open them unless you're in a very clean environment. So we keep little sections in our lab um, clean of dust. Like Maybe you've seen clean rooms in... Um, on TV or like in like detective shows and stuff where they go into the special rooms and they've got all these white suits on so you can't see anything. So um, there are some aspects of our telescope that we don't open, we don't touch unless we're there. Um, there's other aspects of our telescopes which are like a, a little bit better. They, they can get a little bit dusty but not much. You don't want to leave them out there. So again, we build kind of pseudo clean rooms where we just like have um, large curtains that can come down and you have to like step on some sticky stuff so you get the dirt off your shoes before you walk through the curtains and so it keeps most of the dust out but it's not an official clean room it's just kind of in the middle um, and then there's the kind of the wild west which is once you've got it uh, as close up as you can we're going to have to drive these telescopes across the desert and we'll probably put some tarps on them and stuff like that but Keeping everything clean enough without dust contamination is like actually something we think about way too much. But well, what about the lens? We're actually looking for 10 year old volunteers. We're also going to get you some squeegees as a, as a cross for cleaning up the telescope. I have another question. What was it? Uh, what about the lens? How do you keep the lens on? The lens. Oh, the lenses. Yeah, so the lenses actually, um, we they get transported in like these effective boxes basically where we um, we have the mounts that the lenses sit in we take them and we put tops on the top and bottom and they don't get they don't get taken out of the lab if they aren't in those like little containers that nothing can get in where everything is closed and then once we do need to install them in the telescope we take them out of we, we are in a most that's when we're in a mostly clean room we're not in a real clean room but we'll take them out there and then put them inside the telescope and then once they're inside the telescope, that the telescope is designed to be a vacuum shell. Air doesn't go in and out of the telescope. If it was, if, if air could get into the telescope, we wouldn't be able to cool down. Um, so once they're actually inside the telescope, that's one of the safest places they can be because we, we don't even like oxygen atoms being able to get inside there. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, that's good. So actually, I'll get him. Hi. Um, I'm one of the pedestrian people, so I really appreciate all your explanations that have been very uh, easy to comprehend. Uh, one of the questions that I have is about collaboration. I know you all are working across the country, so I'm curious what are some of the challenges or some of the successes that come from collaborating with each other? Just checking. The audience hear that? Okay. So, First of all, we like lay people. We're called they're called normals, normies. Uh, uh, thank, actually, for all you normies who are out there, not you team SOT members, you get your own. So I brought some samples of space dust, which Lisa, Professor Will, is an expert in. These are also known as meteorites. So I want you to get one, and you to get one as well. I brought hopefully enough for all the. Uh, attendees, the lay people, so to speak. So collaboration is actually the best part of this project. Uh, the fact that, you know, when, when we have these meetings, and set, people from all seven continents who have spent time there uh, are coming here. Uh, it, it's just astounding. No other branch of society really invokes so many different people from so many different backgrounds, cultures, cuisines, which I love the most, uh, and, uh, and and languages and everything. I once counted it up, you know, just how many different languages, how many different countries. It's dozens and dozens. It's just astounding. And 
the fun part about that is is are the relationships. You know, it's, the, it's an old you know kind of cliche. What matters are the friends we made along the way. Well, we're going to be together for eight years building this project. Started in 2016. We first proposed this project. It grew from 40 million dollars. Now it's over 100 million dollars. Biggest project of its kind. It's poised to grow to 200 million dollars and maybe more. So I started thinking about this as fractions of a billion dollars. Uh, it's just astounding that we're able to do this, but we can only do this because of the strength of the collaboration and team members. So we run, unfortunately, most of the observatory is run by Zoom. Uh, if Zoom went down, you know, the telescope would be years behind. Uh, and, but the strength of the connections between the collaborators and these different institutions was really made evident during the pandemic because we really could not have survived this. And, and it's a cliche again, you know, to say that, you know, a, a good experiment, you know, can, can survive a you know a catastrophe or a crisis but a great experiment is made better by crises like this and i think we've come together in a more focused mission even though we're delayed by two years which adds about five hundred thousand dollars i have to come up with five hundred thousand dollars well, i don't come up with it but <laughs> the observatory is, spends five hundred thousand dollars a month on people on supplies on travel on equipment on contracts and all the different aspects of the observatory uh, but really the most important thing are the people that allow the collaboration to work these are some of the smartest people you have to realize that these people up here all of them and i'm not going to tell them this you know in another circumstance when i'm not inebriated because they might leave and go work for google or for a hedge fund this people like this in this cohort are doing you know our top you know CEOs or management tracks or working at hedge funds or working at Google the fact that they choose the square root of those salaries to work as you know I don't know what you make at fancy rich Ivy League schools but uh, but as a graduate student I made fourteen thousand dollars a year I probably could have made a little bit more uh, doing almost anything and uh, but I did it because I love the science and I expect that you guys do too and it's another form of compensation that to me is intangible and. The fact that it works synergistically, that we love have working together, and we can, you know, hopefully provide an environment that makes it pleasant for you guys to work with us, because you did forego so many other opportunities. Hopefully, it's a win-win, win-win-win to the 300 pound. Yeah, hopefully. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to comment on salaries. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, collaborations here are actually really fun in that. There's just so many places where you can go across the U.S., internationally, etc., to go and actually see and work with people solving really hard, complicated problems. Um, like even before before the pandemic, I had frequent flyer status just from ending up visiting other labs and taking things that I was working on to their lab and trying to help them set things up or going to their lab to teach me what I needed to figure out how to work in, work in, our, in mine. And that like interaction and stuff is like something that many, many of the people back here are doing. Like I don't know, if people were here earlier, you know, there's a lot of people hugging other people who had not seen each other in several years because this is our first face-to-face -face now and it's been three years since then. And so some people have actually not seen each other. Uh, Zoom actually, uh, I think has probably permanently revolutionized our field as well as everyone else's. Um, during the pandemic, originally the plan was that the detector folks at Princeton were going to fly out and they were going to teach us how to install a detector package um, so that we didn't break it because they're very breakable. Uh, and terrifyingly, the pandemic meant that only two of us or three of us at some points were allowed in our lab, so we definitely weren't flying people to pr from Princeton to help us install detectors. So instead, we got a webcam and a, you know, a conference speaker and a laptop and had it set up on a ladder just kind of pointed at the optics tube where we were trying to install detectors. Um, and we didn't break it. It works. Uh, so that was good. Um, but that, that sort of like event and that sort of like, uh, you know, set of like events has been happening constantly throughout this throughout the pandemic and even before although it usually involved a lot more plane flights before and uh the plane flights are coming back now which is very exciting uh, like i was at pin uh last week with uh <laughs> until two days ago um again like i had i had, a, had to build to our optics tube at chicago and i there are seven of us in my lab um so uh, we had built this optics tube in Chicago, and then we're going over and trying to help the folks at UPenn actually get the detectors working there, because it's a lot of the same stuff working in different locations. And so it's um, it's cool. It's great to come visit people. You get to go eat, to go get lots of food, and uh, hang out, and try to solve problems.
had a question. That'll be the last one. I only want to ask you, as far as I can tell, now is like the golden age of astronomy and astrophysics because of all these new telescopes, the Demeter Telescope, the Mirror Urban Telescope, James Webb Space Telescope, the Observatory, more than ever, apparently. What do you think is the impact on society from all these discoveries that are about to occur? All right. I, I, I know you're probably itching to take this one. Um, I think that or should I make all of you do it? Okay, I'm going to make all of you do it. <laughs> yeah, um, I think it's just amazing that we can learn so much about the universe from our little corner. Um, it's amazing that we can learn so much about the universe, like billions of years, you know, events that happened billions of years ago. Um, and I feel like we... And it's amazing that we can learn about the entire universe just from these observations. It's not like we're just observing one tiny thing and learning about it. We're like really learning about like the fundamental laws of every like that govern everything that we that we know and that has happened since. So I think that's that as humans being that maybe it puts us into it puts everything into perspective. Um, it teaches it teaches us something about everything it's it's just um, and I think it's also I mean I'm sure that a lot of technology has been developed um, but by the, from the work that we do I, um, I mean we talked about how we cool down our detectors to very low temperatures uh, that same technology is the same technology that now is driving quantum computing for instance so like more tangible maybe technologies that society will eventually benefit from um, uh, but I think, I mean, in the end, it's all about, I, I mean, at least for me or for most of us, it's learning about the universe and um, taking pride in being able to do that with what, like, with what, with the technologies that we have developed as, as human beings, as humanity. Yeah. I don't know how to follow that. Yeah, that was very good. That was, that was, exactly, like, we... Like, as a human society, it's like, I think it's great that we continue to look and try to understand more about, like, where we are, right? Like, we go to the bottom of the ocean, we go out into space, we, we want to understand the things that we just don't see every single day in our lives. And I think the curiosity of the human race is something that's great and something that uh, should never be fully stifled, right? Or should never be stifled at all, really. Um, and all of that is super exciting and yes there are technological benefits of that because that's the other question that everyone asks is uh, what, what, are, what are you working on and what can it become and what can it be used for and uh, at some level that's ancillary to me I do this for the science and I do this to be able to build things that at the end of the day will get to tell us fundamental things about the universe so I'll, I'll be more sentimental like, like Karen was uh, so well, the thing I like best about astronomy is uh, is that nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I hate that damn Republican constellation over there. That Democratic asteroid sucks. Uh, we don't have those kind of tribal you know, battles within science, within astronomy particularly. There's other forms of science that does get politicized. But astronomy is very hard to politicize. Uh, and that part about it, I think we need a safe space. I think we need a place where we think about things not tribally, not polarized in the political sense. We think about polarization a lot, but not of that kind. And to me, that that is, is a very valuable thing. The human mind needs a safe space to think about things. The essence of human beings, homo sapien, the words homo sapien means one who knows. What do we know? That animal, no animal knows that we're going to die someday. And then we have a finite amount of existence in which we can understand how everything came to be, perhaps. Or we can make a tiny little incremental thing, turning one screw, perhaps, that allows the whole experimental work, um, or analyzing data, or coming up with some new theory. It's, it's amazing what a human being can do. And it's amazing more so what 300 human beings can do. And hopefully unlock this. As, as Katie said, you know, the problem sometimes with science is that it's expected to produce technology. So we're doing this without any expectation thereof, um, although there may be things that come of it. And I think that's uh, of, of secondary importance to me, which is the most ultimate question that we could possibly answer. How did we get here? And I think that's good enough. <laughs> I can bring a lot of the things.
things that the others have said. I think that one of the biggest things that this boom in astronomy that will hopefully be coming in the next couple of next couple of decades, really, with all the new telescopes that are coming out, is really one of inspiration. You know, there there's something about new discoveries. There's something about learning something new and realizing that something that you thought was perhaps a, a hard boundary or something that you thought ah. Uh, we'll never figure that out or something that we won't know about because it just can't be discovered or even the unexpected discoveries. There's something about seeing those barriers falling. There's something about finding those new discoveries that you didn't know were out there. So searching for things just because it's worth doing in itself to some extent, which is what you were talking about, worth doing because it's something that, that can bring a sort of inspiration, um, not only to us, I think that we are all very inspired and also very tired at times by our work, um, but there's also a lot of inspiration I think that people in society can and should take from all, these, all of these different discoveries in terms of wanting to learn more, in terms of wanting to be curious, in terms of wanting to, to get involved even. Um, that's something that in terms of citizen science and in terms of education and outreach that all of you can be involved and engaged in, whether it's teaching the next generation or inspiring someone to get involved in science or simply learning more yourself just because it's a lot of fun. All of those th things are things that I'm really hoping that in the next 20, 30 years, all of these different telescopes and the amazing images and the amazing discoveries that they make will help to continue inspire in our society. Thank you, everybody. And just a reminder, if you did pay to come here and you're not one of the Simons Observatory collaborators, come on up and get a meteorite from there was truly 4.8 billion year old space dust that fell in Argentina. Yours for showing up tonight. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to Lisa for being such an amazing moderator tonight. And science outreach extraordinary. Have you, got, have you ever gotten one? 